Okay, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today on uh, this new uh, type of session that we're trying, the, the contributor uh, track as part of our community sessions. Uh, this being the first one, you'll have to excuse us if there's a few bumps or a few things that we're working out as we go along. Uh, we're going to do our best. Um, also, as usual, we'll share a, a feedback form uh, please give us any tips or hints how we can make these sessions better. Um, so welcome. This being the first contributor uh, session today, we have a few things on the agenda. Uh, we're going to jump in with a contributor spotlight. Um, and then we're going to go through to we have a couple of demos of things. And then we have a few discussion topics that have been added to the uh, GitHub issue. So first up... Today, I wanted to congratulate Andre uh, as contributor, uh, as our contributor for Contributor Spotlight this time around. Uh, voted for and picked for within the community. We got a few suggestions, um, particularly if I uh, do this, hopefully you can see there are a couple of bits. Uh, so particularly the adding the Azure DevOps uh, backend plugin uh, was one of the call outs that we got. Um, and also the timer to the composable homepage. So here we go for a little bit of real time. I'm hoping you're here. Andre, are you on the call right now? Yes, I am. Fantastic. So congratulations. Thank you for Thank all you. of the efforts. And uh, thank you for all of the hard work, sir. And I, I just wanted to, if I can, pick your brain for a second. Um, for can sure. you tell us a little bit about you and tell us a little bit about kind of your focus with Backstage? So I've been a developer for about 15 years. Um, I live here in Winnipeg in Canada. Um, so I always enjoy time zone fun. Um, I uh, am a sort of a tech lead on infrastructure, um, which is kind of weird because we actually do developer experience. Um, we did a small POC on at Backstage in December of last year um, and just thought it was awesome and was going to do uh, great for us. Um, we were a small Canadian company, but we recently got acquired uh, by another a company based in the UK, um, which is actually really great because they have a bunch of different tools. So they use Jenkins and Jira and Bamboo, and this is the amazing thing about Backstage is that we're going to be able to integrate all of those systems and bring all of these developers together. Even though I'm very focused on Azure DevOps, um, as you mentioned with the pull requests. So, so yeah, so that's kind of what I do and where we're at, and we're using Backstage. So it's really exciting, and it is, I love the community. Everyone is very helpful. Um, I'm learning a ton. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed. This is not something that I thought was going to happen today. <laughs> <laughs> we like to surprise and put you on, put hey. you on the spot. I'm, um, I'm, hey, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious, like uh, through this journey that you've had, like working with Backstage, et cetera, has there been any, uh, like it's great to hear this awesome stuff. Has there been any, um, has there been any gotchas uh, that, you, that you've come across that you've had to kind of work around or, or any kind of tips you want to share for anybody else uh, going on this journey? Yeah, I'm, I've been trying to bowl my brains over the last five minutes to, to have some suggestions. Um, like search is your friend. I found for me, searching the GitHub repo, searching the Discord, um, there's lots of information there. I probably would say the biggest gotcha that we, we've had, and we've had to just basically kind of unwind the onion, is um, to do the, the tech doc CLI. That hasn't worked out really well for us. We ended up actually just running make docs ourselves and and, and copying the files to min.io ourselves because that that particular pattern just it, it never worked out for us. We just ran into weird issues. But once the files were on the share, everything worked awesome. But yeah, doing this, doing that part of it, kind of like getting the content and, and delivering it to S3, that's probably the only place where we unfortunately couldn't just use uh, what had, had been built. Please, no knock on the tech docs. I love it. I, I just... That's the that's the only area where we kind of had problems and we couldn't just again use the awesome tooling that had been built. Oh, cool! I can I can see Eric thinking about tapping away, so I'm pretty certain you're going to get some questions in a minute of uh, of how we can improve it. But um, For yeah, sure. sure, yeah, I'm more than happy to fill out an issue and kind of go through all the, the the things that we've run into. It also could be just the our environment. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, again, I mean, congratulations, dude. Thank you for all of the input and, and being part of this awesome community. Um, and yeah, keep it up. Keep it up, sir. For sure. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Okay, so we're going to move on uh, to some demos and that side of things. And I'm hoping, uh, you say you're, you're here. Um, I believe you had um, a demo around Tech Insights backend. Um, yeah, uh, I actually don't have a demo, but I was thinking of bringing it up, bringing it up once again to kind of discuss a little bit about it. So... Sounds good. Getting getting metrics, displaying metrics, getting scorecards and stuff like that in the backstage is kind of, yeah, it's a big thing. We kind of want to make it move forward. There was also this like small company in Sweden. I think they are in the music business that released a blog post on the 18th of uh, October about how they use backstage to do the metrics. Uh, the company called Spotify, I think. And... Uh, and this Tech Insights backend uh, pull request that I opened earlier this week is kind of the groundwork for other companies to try to imitate whatever Spotify is doing in their own backstage instances, I guess, as well. Um, we could take a look at the architecture a little bit just to give an overview how it would look. If, um, Lee, you're able to give me like sharing permissions maybe. And while we are waiting here, I think the question that I kind of wanted to bring up is just to have as much as much uh, context around this and um, kind of knowledge from other companies as well, how they would like to see the whole tech insights work and what would they actually display on those. This okay. three is the correct one, right? You are seeing a closed pull request, I'm guessing. That's right, yep. Yeah. yeah. So, that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say one thing that I could see being useful uh, for us would be being able to see status about pull requests from the pro so from the projects that are that are registered, like is there a way to see how long an average pull request is open? Uh, you know how many pull requests are stale? Like some some data, some, some kind of some kind of uh, metrics around the performance of pull requests. Would it be something like that? That yeah, for sure. um, whatever that reads there. Number of metrics or what was the main metric? Time to merge your tenth pull request, right? That's what Spotify is using for their, yeah, big, big uh, target or something. Um, yeah, so all of that kind of stuff would be possible to do with this Tech Insights backend functionality that we have kind of created. So the pull request itself, it contains a framework around creating these kind of metrics and it consists of essentially two parts. One part is to actually getting the data, which can be like retrieved anywhere. It can be the GitHub API, if you want to call that. It can be your CI pipeline, or it can be like an external system that you have actually used to gather metrics elsewhere already. Um, that's what we kind of, start calling fact retrievers because they are facts that we are essentially storing as these um, uh, values for metrics. And then the other part is checking the metrics, so actually generating the result from them and seeing if it matches like expectations and stuff like that. The implementations that uh, are present in this pull request they are very specific to separate, um, just checking against Boolean values. So, okay, you might not create a check that checks that the pull request time is, 10th pull request time is less than uh, two weeks or whatever. 
Uh, so you wouldn't create checks out of that, but because you have those values available already in here, you can create an external scorecard saying that, okay, the 10th pull request took, I don't know, two weeks again, and create visualizations based on that. So that's that's the whole premise, basically, of Tech Insights and how we kind of thought of approaching that to kind of get the framework ready for the whole community, for the community to be able to create this, um, this image that I wanted, the fact retrievers to actually get their own data into the database. And then we can start iterating from there to try to figure out now we have all of this data, what do we actually do with it? Do we create scorecards out of it using these checkers or do we want to display them directly, maybe create some graphs and stuff like that, that might be useful to be displayed for users. Um, yeah, that's, that's a small rant. Just wanted to bring it up kind of trying to push people to have another look at it, maybe give some feedback and see if we can figure out some use cases that may not be covered yet within this backend framework. So I guess open up for, for discussion and as, as well for uh, the Spotifyers, particularly like the Spotify metrics and, and the things that we've done. Um, I can talk to the time to 10th to pull request. I know that's been a backbone that I've, I've kind of, leaned on as part of the the work here but if there's anybody else as well on the spotify front or wider community um open for discussion one of the things that they that we have uh, with one of our clients is in terms of a use case they would like to learn they would like to be able to find people or find assets based on in the catalog based on uh useful like you could say facts uh so i was curious if you have any thoughts about how the um, how the how this is it possible to use this engine to gather information about um, about like for example, what you know? Can we find? Can we track people's uh, expertise or or familiarity with React, for example? Like, can we identify people within the ecosystem who have experience? Um, do you see this architecture be uh, being able to enable that kind of use case, or do, or do you see it uh, kind of strictly fitting within the kind of specific um, visualizations that that can be displayed? I think I think it depends what kind of visualization you want to create out of that. But let's let's say you want to create like uh, we call them scorecards, but uh, in other companies that we I've worked with, we've called them like capability matrices and stuff like that. And this, this uh, whole fact retriever engine and check engine would be able to accommodate that as well. So you would create your own fact retriever to get the data from somewhere, first of all. Maybe it is some Excel sheet or Google sheet or whatever, where it's manually updated. Or maybe it is some certificates that you have stored somewhere internally and then store that data in, in a suitable format in Backstage itself. And after you have all, all of that available, then you can run uh, or you can then create scorecards out of that one for individual users as well. It kind of depends. Do you want to do that? Maybe it's too public information for users to do it, but that's kind of another topic to discuss, I guess. In that particular case, we'd like to see how we can use this information as part of search prioritization. That would be uh, so we could so we could say. Um, if we associate someone to a specific skill, can we can we show that person uh, like organize like prioritize at the top of the list if they have a lot of it? Like if they have a lot of if they contributed a lot of React components, for example, uh, show the and so what types in React they show up at the top of the list as opposed to someone who just has who has a code in the repo that has like React tag associated with it, but they don't actually have any commits that they add of their own. Um, that's the kind of thing that that um, we're particularly thinking about. Um, I'm not sure if it's if if you have any thoughts about that kind of a use case with this architecture. Yeah, I haven't thought about that kind of use case for for this one. Um, in software world, everything is is possible, right? But 
uh, I think I think it's the domains for that kind of thing might be too much apart. As in, it is possible to do, but I, I'm not sure if it's like the main purpose yeah, of the whole tech right. insights. Mm -hmm. Got it. If that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Um, if there's, uh, I can see a little bit of a, a, a chat going on as well. Um, if there's no other kind of main uh, questions that people want to raise, uh, you say thank you for for, for bringing it up uh, and and the conversation there. Let's uh, let's move on to the next. So we have a. Um, uh, a, a conversation, a demo from Kat. I don't think she's actually joined us just yet around homepage templating. Um, but uh, Taras, I know that you did the demo yesterday at the adopter session. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody here saw that, uh, but I think there was a little bit of a crossover probably between this session and, and that session of the, the relevance of it. And I know you were interested in getting some feedback. Um, I'm wondering if, if that's a topic you want to broach. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I'd like to get some. Uh, so yesterday we showed the simulation tool and we wanted to show it yesterday because it is very much geared towards uh, like we're using it as as people who are creating the portal. So uh, so not necessarily, so I think there's definitely a use for it in the underlying um, in the in in doing development of backstage framework because there is a lot of in backstage framework tests there's a lot of uh, mocking going on of external services and that and that in itself can be quite difficult because the you need to like i, I remember when i was writing tests for the for tech docs uh when i was writing files to um to azure storage i, I had to mock out the the classes um and writing i was essentially writing like implementation of the classes that accumulated state and a lot of those kind of tests, you end up writing like, uh, like first of all, they're not easy to write. They're not any easier than than potential alternatives, um, and and they require and 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 they require like understanding how those classes are written. Um, and so the alternative, uh, I think, for writing for doing those kind of tests would be to um, essentially make an API call to um, to Azure and instead of responding with real Azure, like we would have a, we'd run a local instance. There is actually an Azure simulation tooling, which we haven't used yet. We haven't integrated with, with our tooling, but it is technically possible. So I'm curious if, if there is interest in, in these ideas, if there's any questions about it, or if I could um, just, just want to kind of get a little bit of thoughts about what we demoed yesterday or if a demo, if if we need to do the demo again or whatever you think. Is this, um, so I'm thinking about the existing integration tests we have in Backstage Repository and is this something which can directly help it or the, like as of now we are mocking a bunch of APIs. Uh, We're also mocking file system. It's a, it's a tiny bit library, mock FS. Um, so I'm thinking like, is this a solution for everything or is this like, how is this only for like big purposes and not for something like inter running integration tests on backstage backstage repository? I, I wanted to write a blog post about this because uh, because I think there is it's a good really good question. Uh, but I I see it as um, there is a way of testing which is which is uh, you your um, you write you simulate the external dependencies and that test can, and that way of testing can, can encompass as much of the assembly as possible. So the smallest unit, so like if, if I think about, um, so I think the answer to your question is that I think we can definitely use this approach for doing something as small as a unit test where you are essentially testing a single unit. So if you wanna test, for example, how you're uploading to, um, how you're uploading from tech docs to uh, to Azure storage, what the the practice here, the way you would actually test this, so instead of doing mocking, what we would do is we would have a simulation running on a URL that 
and then we would control what URL the test uses. So it essentially say like when you're running when when you're running this code, the you're going to like my you're going to connect to the specific URL, and then the simulator would respond. Um, and I think the advantage of that, uh, I think the challenge with that approach is that first of all, the simulator needs to be created because uh, we we started like we what what we demoed yesterday is um, LDAP and um, Oz zero, so we created the Oz zero simulator that's uh, open source. We have, we created LDAP a simulator, which we we forked another library that that did some LDAP mocking, and we essentially wrapped it so that it could be configured as um as part of a bigger simulation. Uh, and we also have a f we also cre started to create the GitHub Enterprise or GitHub a GraphQL API simulator, but each of those simulators need to be created. I think the, the, the challenge, of course, is it needs to be created. The, the flip side of that is that once the simulators exist, we don't need to we don't need to remock in every scenario. We can just use that simulator, start start the simulator and test. Um, and you're essentially doing integration testing um, as opposed to doing unit testing. But it can be at the size of a unit in the sense that you're testing a single unit. But that same that same mechanism could be used to test bigger assembly. Uh, so as what we're doing, like the way I see this working with with the tools that we have today that we're using for our client, um, what I what I demoed was using this tooling to um, to to run the actual backstage instance. But what but the way I see we're going to be testing this is that when we're going to be testing the LDAP processor, what we'll do is we'll stand up the simulated LDAP LDAP server um, and then we'll. Uh, we'll run the LDAP processor in isolation, like we'll create an instance of the LDAP processor, execute it, uh, or maybe execute it together with the with the engine, uh, with the catalog engine, and let, have the catalog engine drive the um, drive the LDAP processor, which is going to connect to our simulator. And by make by doing this, we're essentially doing kind of integration testing of the of the entire chain, um, but it's still focused on the one unit, which is the uh, which is the LDAP processor. Like that's the way that I think right. this would work if we had this uh, in in unit tests. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Thanks for the explanation. Thanks. I I'm curious. Like, do people do, are people are quiet? So, like, do people think this is a really terrible idea, <laughs> or, or or is this like really out there, or is it like I, I'm I'm curious what people think? Like, uh, because I know simulation has been around for a long time, but it's it's there's actually surprisingly very little tooling for simul doing simulation in in this kind of context. So, um, what would help the what would help this idea? Is it is it easy to understand the specific use case? I, I can speak for myself at least. Uh, I think it's a really interesting use case, especially for like if you have a um, uh, known upstream that you want to um, uh, to mock or simulate, but uh, I'm I'm a bit. What worries me a bit is like uh, doing like edge cases and having to, like, how do you control? Now I want the simulator to to uh, when calling the same user endpoint or someone, uh, for example, start throwing some error and so on. Like, mm. and those cases where you want to uh, basically start injecting errors, like, uh, mm. and and simulating that in the tests. Um, and also potentially yeah. like, I mean, if we like for LDAP, like you, you have to basically implement the LDAP protocol or like have a simulator that speaks, which makes for a really good test, but it's also, uh, a big overhead for, for, um, uh, writing the, the tests. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, so the first thing you mentioned, uh, I think we're going to get more experience with that in the near future as we start to integrate this into testing, because we definitely, uh, want to. Uh, like this is kind of easy with GraphQL. It's like, for example, with GraphQL, like let's say there's some kind of error, you didn't respond, you you just emitted some data. Like so, if you're testing the the negative paths, uh, being able to induce the negative paths, is, I think is really important. That's the um, so, and I think this kind of goes hand in hand with, um, I think this kind of a thing can't really be done. Like we're a small team, so we I, I think what we're going to do is we're going to bootstrap certain certain um, certain. Uh, simulators, but those simulators have to be open source because there's just too um, too many. Um, uh, it's there's just too many things that we can simulate, right? Because like in um, in the in our particular case, I think right now a backstage already probably connects with what 15 systems at least. 
right? So if you wanted to be able to simulate all of these and induce uh, induce states that we want for testing, um, there needs to be kind of shared shared simulators that we could use for all these use cases. So we're going to try to do as part of our consulting when we're working with our clients, we're going to try to create as many of these things, create as many of the simulators and build some tooling to make this, make building simulators easier. Um, and, and uh, you, you know, you can expect some blog posts in the near future about like what we're learning in process of doing this thing with our clients. Because for us, this has already been a really, like it, it literally was a difference between being able to work with a client and not being able to work with a client because we did not have access to their VPN. We actually had no access to any of their systems. So if we didn't have something like this, we would not be able to um, do the kind of optimization, uh, like writing the processors that we needed to do. Um, so I'm hoping that um, we can kind of bootstrap this. And if there's people who are interested, then then we can start to create some shared uh, shared simulators that uh, that will have the capability to do the kind of like negative negative paths testing that we want to be able to do. Yeah, that would be very interesting. And I mean, I think this is something that applies to not only Backstage, but like all other software that wants to do like testing against external systems and so on. Yeah, I agree. There's there's a, um, there's a Google had a coin this term hermetic systems like back in like 10 years ago. Uh, but it, it's um, essentially being able to run your entire system and it apply, aligns really well with containers. It could basically run your entire system in a container and disconnect the, dis, disconnect the network from that container and have everything you need inside of that container. I think that that idea, like empowering that idea is actually like a, can apply to everything. Uh, but I think that for us, like partially because we are already focusing on backstage, I think what we're going to try to do is um, focus on making the backstage use cases really easy because I think whatever we learn in this case is going to apply to every other every other ecosystem because backstage in many ways represents like a really well architected common common architecture that uh, that you know uh, most of us are building in our in our at our at work there is a there's a comment here um, I find LDAP case compelling uh, being able to test scale queries for example against large bodies of data especially for confidence in the custom processor. Yeah, we have. So we actually have this use case right now because we started off with, uh, we had, um, uh, we we ran the processor like we we ran the default backstage processor against I think a thousand records. Then we ran it against a hundred thousand records, and it did not. <laughs> it did not work. So we just like cramped up, cramped up the number to a hundred thousand uh, to a hundred thousand LDAP users and sat there and nothing got admitted. So we're like, okay, why is it not? Why not? Why why did nothing actually land in our database? So we we actually saw this firsthand. Uh, so we're now we're using this now to optimize the actual ingestion of LDAP. Um, we we've, we've had some approaches before, but this gives us a little bit more control over um, over over that mechanism because we can actually control the LDAP simulator itself. And Brian wrote, we have two basic levels of testing at Rody. We have Docker Compose environment with some services. And then we mock at the library level for unit tests. Um, the Docker Compose environment has a container for front end, back end, local stack instance, and testing IWS stuff in another with a database. Yeah, this is basically uh, that's that's what I was that's that's a, essentially a kind of a description of hermetic system uh, using Docker Compose. So you have uh, it, the the question is whether or not we it's possible to isolate that environment. I think that's the part that I'd really love to get to, and I hope we're going to get to the near future. Is um, we we have um, I, I want to see I want to try to overlap dev containers with the idea of dev containers with the um, with uh, with um, the idea of simulation. So you have essentially you when you're doing back, backstage portal development um, the, inside of dev, dev container, you have all of the services that the, the container that the portal uses. Um, and they're all running inside of the dev container. Um, we've looked at, we've used local stack as well in the past. Um, that's a that's a pretty cool tool for AWS development. If I remember correctly, yeah, AWS. Yeah, on, yeah. on Rody side, we I mean, we create quite a lot of plugins as well. So creating those free trial accounts for every single service on the planet gets a little bit tiring at times to do these kind of testings. So yeah, it's it's very useful for us as well to actually have some kind of what did you call them simulation system, 
So Moxie yeah, I, yeah, I think we're going to try see if we can wrap local stack in in a simulation plugin to see what that would look like. There's they have a lot of systems, so it's it's definitely not a trivial task. There's a lot of APIs here. There's a, we we have a lot to learn before we can get to a point where we can do something like this. It's it's really um I think we can do we could do some things, but uh, this like local stack is 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 very comprehensive. There's quite a lot here. Okay. Well, if, uh, so thank you, thank you, Lee, for for uh, letting me ask. I mean, start a conversation about this. I really appreciate it. Not at all. I mean, that's what this community is for, right? We're all here to to learn and and uh, help each other out and and push things forward. So. Absolutely. Thank you for, for, for checking in on all of that and, and, and putting that stuff forward. Thanks, Taras. Um, okay, up next, uh, Kat, uh, I believe you wanted to talk, talk about some homepage templates. Hi, yes. Can you all hear me? Yep. Sweet. I'm going to go share my screen for a little bit. Okay. Oop. Can you all see this? So there is um, an issue out um, in GitHub 7249, and um, it is around the backstage homepage template. Um, and let me actually redirect my screen share to um, a Figma prototype. Um, can you all see this now? Cool. Uh, thanks for the thumbs up, y'all. So um, there's been some work that's been done by um, folks in Spotify. Shout out to like Ruben and Emma and others, um, as well as the contributors who helped out around the composable homepage. Um, and what we thought was exciting was it, to give you all um, the opportunity within your organizations to put together a homepage that makes sense for you. Um, and then we realized it can be daunting to just be given all the, the tools and just say, here, make a homepage, um, make a homepage. All right. Um, and so I just want to share, um, this is what our internal backstage homepage looks like. We, it might look a little bit unfamiliar. Um, we actually went through a, a little redesign earlier this year. And uh, this was, kind of spurred by some user research that we had done in the beginning of the year um, with internal Spotify backstage users. Um, and we realized that folks really wanted discoverability to be um, more easy to, to um, find things. And they also wanted to, to kind of just be able to go into backstage and search for what they wanted. Um, and so that was kind of the logic behind what we were doing. Um, and so with that, we, we kind of want to give folks uh, a template with this composable homepage element um, to get started and hit the ground running, right? And so instead of just giving you the building box, we'll give you a little, little guide. Um, and this was um, this template. It was modeled off of our internal one. Um, and we got some amazing feedback from you all around what you actually wanted to see um, in your own homepages and within your orgs. Um, and so I uh, want to emphasize that this is just one template. We are actually thinking of creating a couple others to complement this um, and allowing you know, teams to choose what works best for them. But the, the idea is that you'd be able to kind of inherit this right out of the box um, homepage experience. Um, and you can do, a lot of stuff with it. Uh, ideally, you'd be able to, you know, add your own, maybe a toolkit section, or maybe you can show some metrics that you think are very important to you um, and have some dashboard elements. Uh, for us, we've uh, heard from our users that they really like to have a frequently visited uh, section so they can quickly get to what they're looking at, um, what's been recent for them. Um, some in in the in the issue itself, we got some feedback, and some folks were proposing um, uh, homepage uh, aspects that had more of these data viz aspects as well, um, which I think is great. And so, as we're exploring these other potential templates, uh, we'll be working on that. Um, and one of the things that we were thinking about more of a moonshot later on is just having more of an onboarding uh, for your homepage when your users start using it, right? Um, allowing folks to kind of see, okay, this is what I'm looking at. Here's some tool tips, just really quick. Like um, I know internally at Spotify Backstage, like 
it can be daunting for uh, engineers to kind of go into it and figure out what they're looking at. So having kind of um, a guiding experience might be nice as well. Um, but this is just a general overview at uh, what we would like to bring to life, which is the template or one or templates themselves. Um, and so uh, for us, we're going to continue on reiterating on some of those designs. And so hopefully we'll have two or three more templates to kind of um, maybe bring to you and maybe they'll work better for you than perhaps a search oriented one that we have at Spotify. Um, and ideally what we would do is to kind of build it out, um, just the rough structure of it using that the composable uh, components um, in the backstage homepage uh, work that Uruub and, and uh, Emma have been doing um, so that you all can kind of take it and go with it. Um, and ideally we'd have it in our storybook, uh, just like we have templates for like a plugin page. Um, so that's just something that uh, I wanted to flag your attention to. And then uh, if you are able to contribute or if you're interested in contributing to this kind of work, please let me know. Um, and if you have any feedback, also let us know in, in that issue. Um, but yeah, let me know if you've got any questions. I have a, one question on, on the layout. And I know Patrick, you were working on this recently. Um, have we landed on like, how do we, how do plugins expose these components? Is the homepage plugin will be responsible for layouts or will the plugins have full autonomy over layouts of these cards? Like where did we settle? So I'm um, when you're saying plugins, you mean like the the plugin templates that already exist? Right. Let's say in, in the home page, I want to add Stack Overflow card, or let's say oh. I want to add Search card, yeah. or something custom into my company. So those plugins will create those cards. Now the idea is that the home page should look consistent, and like plugins are not exposing this random octagonal thing because yeah. you want consistency. Right. So. There's a, this bit of attention, like do plugins dictate uh, how the cards look or should the homepage dictate uh, like for consistency? So for us, what we're thinking is, of is having some guidance around or like best practices around how you might be able to configure your homepage. Ideally, you would not put some like, you know, <laughs> um, maybe inaccessible, inaccessible uh, component uh, that maybe doesn't work very well with the other surrounding elements. Um, so what we'll be offering, and it's actually, it already exists a little bit in um, the, in our backstage uh, Figma document, um, which is linked to that issue actually. Uh, and we've provided some loose guidance around how to think about structuring that. Um, and I think that's something that we want to actually vamp, revamp more and more for a variety of different aspects of backstage um, components and, and experiences, not just the homepage, but we want to be better at providing that kind of guiding documentation for folks as they're building a plugin or whatever. Um, so uh, for us, I think we um, we provide these templates so that people can kind of get a general idea of how to, you know, stay within a recommended and, and tried and tested um, framework. Um, and if they do want to kind of venture off, they, they can, but it would not be advised <laughs> um, unless they uh, maybe figured out a better way to do it and they want to propose it to us and we can integrate that into um, the homepage as well. That's a great part, I think. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Sorry, I have, a, I have a quick question. Uh, I, I haven't seen the code behind this, but will the header be something we can adopt? Like, is, is that part of the template customizable as well? When you say the header- I, I was reviewing, yeah, like you have, like the pattern has always been like that nice color header piece. And so as, as a team who have backstage running for a while, going to this template and seeing the header kind of display is like a little jarring. So will we be able to customize that part in the template? Oh yeah, so um, yes. Okay, so everything is customizable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, awesome. Great stuff. Thank, thank you for bringing this up, Kat, and, and for sharing and, and whatnot. I'm sure you'll get a, a bunch of feedback on the, on the issue and, a, and I'm sure a ton of questions to come. And uh, thank you for, for Ruben and Emma as well. Um, I know Ruben's not here, but I think Emma's in the background as well uh, for, for their work on the composability stuff. So awesome to see it move along. Um, 
Okay, we're coming up to about quarter to the hour. Um, I am going to hand over the controls to Mr. Hamanshu, I think, who you added something around API refs and bullying the backstage maintainers. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to hand it over to you and yeah. uh, let's go through that. <laughs> I do enough bullying, uh, bullying outside of the session. No, I wanted to pick people's brain. Uh, so I've been using API refs for things like authentication in backstage. So you, I, I, I use this hook called use API and then pass in an API ref, which is very small thing. And now I have an instance of API and then I can do stuff. And then there's another possibility that, that why, don't, why, why is it not in like a global API? Why, it's, why can't I just import it from somewhere and use outside of React context? Um, so like, basically I love API refs. They're great, but I don't understand what they are. Or what's the philosophy behind it? And uh, I just wanted to start a discussion on that. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, I, I, we can go back to the roots of them, perhaps. Um, what backstage looked like before API refs. Mm. That there were a lot of kind of common utilities for things like authentication, as you mentioned, error logging, those kind of things. But basically, the APIs you see um, now, storage, so on. Um, and that was kind of for all plugins to share. And there was not a lot of structure to it. And there was a lot of kind of just just module mocking in tests. And that happening quite deeply too. Uh, some tests got really messy. So we wanted to kind of just um, first off, make these APIs a thing more than maybe just a function that you imported in places. And we... I wanted to move towards dependency injection and be able to mock things by default in tests. And that I think that last one is a pretty big one. Uh, once you start writing uh, you know, plugins that depend on a lot of these different APIs to just not have to deal with mocking the Google Auth API unless you want to test the failure path. So that was kind of, the, the, so API refs became a thing in uh, our non-open source backstage before open source backstage existed. Uh, then it happened to also fit very well as a point of indirection in in the open source version as well, to let application to have plugins um, declare an interface, and have the application be able to replace uh, the implementation of that interface, so that you could switch out you know exactly how you do GHE auth or error alerting and those kind of things, and then on top of that we kind of extended it a bit so that it became a pattern that was easy for plugins to use as well. Because that was kind of one of those things that never really existed internally. Uh, but just have it as a nice pattern for plugins that want to have their own kind of API. Um, that can potentially sometimes be overridden by that, but sometimes it's just a an internal pattern for how, how you structure kind of um, async code, really. There's one like thing we wanted to do with API refs because we looked a lot around a lot at uh, um, different other solutions for dependency injections and those kind of things. Looked mm. at, looking at Angular and so on for inspiration. Um, mm. One thing we really wanted was, you know, have it work well with TypeScript, and that's largely why we arrived at the the API that exists right now, where everything is kind of carried along, uh, and you don't need to. TypeScript is out of the way. Um, Kind of when you work with APIs. It's a really good explanation. Um, I can al already imagine me cropping this bit of the video and like putting up a new video. Like, what are APLFs? Here, Patrick's answer to it. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can feel the testing. Um, I was working with uh, Backstage in, in Spotify recently, and then uh, I was wondering, like, testing is already taken care of, uh, and that's like almost magical. So I think without having unique um, like identity of these, I, I know APRFs are like tagged with something like code dot auth dot something for for identifying which which instance is this. So we can we can locate them, um, locate the instance of APRF, APIs and, and mock them um, automatically in test. Cool. You, you mentioned not being able to call them from outside the React context, though, right? Was that yeah. part of your question? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's sort of a drawback right now, right? It's uh, primarily geared for consumption within React. Um, Patrick, do you want to mention something about plans around that or, or like mitigation? We, we, we should mention the other pattern for, for consuming them, right? So you can consume APIs um, 
uh, using uh, the use API hook, but you can also um, like you, you have to kind of exist within uh, the API kind of code path. Uh, but if if you want to depend on an API in your plugin, you can yourself declare an API. Uh, and this I should really link to a thing here to clarify that a little bit. Uh, but a plugin can can provide its own APIs. Like you can you can have a plugin that declares its own declares its own API, provides an API factory, uh, and makes that available to the React tree. And when you have your own API, that API is allowed to depend on other APIs. So that's kind of the way you're supposed to, uh, if if you want to have um, dependencies not directly within the React tree um, on other APIs. That's the way to do it. I will I will link to a uh, the documentation for this. Just as a call out that there is another way to do it, but I find it a bit hard to describe with words without code. Thanks. I think uh, that was good enough uh, food for my curiosity. So thanks for the discussion. Cool. Um, OK, so um, we're, we're fast approaching the, the top of the hour. Before I go into kind of a wrap up mode and a, a, just a couple of bit of, of housekeeping pieces, is there any other questions or topics uh, relatively short in the next kind of nine minutes or so that anybody else wants to to share? I have one. Uh, so I remember when in the, in the first community session, I uh, put this topic about like everyone share your uh, tips of contributing to backstage. I wonder how is it going? We have come a far, far into this journey of contributing to backstage and things are pretty and like, getting a lot stable now. Uh, and I wonder if someone would like to share any experience, any recent experience, like uh, during Hacktoberfest, I, I was able to contribute to this plugin and it, any thoughts on the ecosystem of uh, of contributions, and open source contributions in the project? Doesn't have to be a good one. <laughs> so something has deteriorated. You can also flag that. And I, I'm not putting anyone on spot. This would be brutal. So <laughs> it's fine <laughs> if this gets ignored. Are, are there any kind of metrics around the contributions, like? Um... I'm curious if you've seen, Himansh, to, to, to your point, if you've seen any kind of changes in those metrics, if they exist, like the number of APRs or time to first yeah. contribution kind of thing. I have a Jupyter notebook, which I carry around in my Google Drive and has a bunch of backstage metrics, but planning to like open source this as well. So the metrics are actually very positive. Um, we have every week, there's always seven to 10 new contributors joining for the past many months. And our number of PRs created in every month is like very high. I think it's uh, PRs plus issues, it's 150 every week. So it's like five days of work, we can 150 new issues and PRs. And this has been consistent for a very long time. So numbers say it, it's, it's a very rapidly growing community, but I also wanted to hear like the experience side of it and not just the numbers, but, but numbers are really nice. Yes, we could also give a small plug if people are interested in like contributing more to the core of Backstage, like the core plugins and so on. We're currently working on um, on uh, stabilizing some of the core components that involves making sure that they're documented, that we have no warnings for uh, in the API reports and so on. There is an issue open now that uh, me and some of the other maintainers are working on, but we're would be happy for people that are like have used some of these uh, methods that are undocumented that want to help out to like just clean up things just to get involved i'm gonna link that in the chat thanks johan uh thanks amanshu as well for for raising that that last one there too um let's head into to the wrap up then um so of course i'm gonna plug our newsletter um as well if people if you haven't please do sign up uh a couple of topics from yesterday's uh sponsor uh sponsor adopter uh meeting as well 
Um, Spotify is, uh, well, we're having a wellness week. So between November 1st and November 5th, uh, we're actually taking some time to, to slow down a little bit. Uh, as such, uh, the same will happen uh, with the maintainers and with the projects. We are going to be a bit slower uh, as we go through that week as everybody takes some some R and R and kind of disconnect a little bit um, in the times that we live in these days. Um, as well as mentioned yesterday, to to plug a little bit, the backstage on conference on November fourth as well. To keep your eyes open from that with uh, from side and Rody. And last but not least, I haven't copied. I'm going to copy the link. We have a feedback form. Um, so please do take a look, provide feedback. We really want to make these sessions better. Um, and we, as we've split them into adopter and contributor, we want to learn a little bit more and and make sure we're getting the right things in each session. Um, outside of that, thank you for everybody today for all of the, the topics. Thank you to Kat for talking about the homepage templates, the tech insights back in there from UC, the topics raised by Himanshu, uh, Andre on uh, the contributor of the month and all of the other topics that I, I've not just uh, mentioned as we've, as we've gone through. Thank you to everybody. Have a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on where you are, and see you all soon.